So the online people have a new background. I'm just looking through my backgrounds I have saved here. I have one which is just a picture of me. So if I like leave the meeting, there's still just a picture of me there. I'll put that one up. There. So if I just go away, I'm still here. Um, yeah, so a couple of things before we get started. Um, Friday's lecture is going to be online, and that's because I'm back in Oak Island again. And so I leave tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to be there until sometime on Friday. And that's going to be my last trip there this year. I'm pretty sure. So um, things should return to normal very soon after that. But I'll still have class like normal. It'll be just online. It'll be, you know, out of the hotel room like before. I think that worked out okay last time. And yeah, we'll see how things go. Um, what else? We have a midterm coming up November 3rd. An email went out yesterday with some initial details, like time, which is useful. So what we're doing is we're booking a slot where everyone in both sections will be writing together at one time. If you have a conflict at that time, just let me know and I can see what I can do. Um, because, yeah, I I expect there'll probably be a few people that'll be in a class or lab or something at that time. So if that's you, just let me know and we'll work something out. The, the midterm is going to be virtual. Like it's going to be done online, not in person, not in this physical space. And that's because like half our class is online. So, you know, for that reason, we don't have much choice. The other thing I wanted to mention early is our final exam has been scheduled for the 19th of December, which I think is the second last day of the exam schedule. And I just wanted everyone to know that that exam is also going to be done by distance, virtual, online, whatever you want to call it. So if you have, uh, you know, a vacation planned or you want to go home to wherever, feel free to get yourself home. You don't have to physically be fulfill to write that exam. That's cool. All right. So what else is new? How are people feeling? Good. Like not, not getting much of a response today. <laughs> uh, we're in chapter five. Feeling OK with the material? Yes and no. Some yeses, some noes. With the midterm that's coming up on the third, it's likely going to cover the first five chapters. I'll send an email out with this, with the exact coverage. It's probably going to be the first five chapters with maybe an emphasis on four and five, just because the oral midterm kind of did one, two, three. So I don't know exactly what the break the breakdown is going to look like but it'll be some combination of material from there. And I'll, I'll let you know. Um, we spoke, I spoke a little bit about format last time, and we still haven't exactly landed on what's going to work best because we can ask questions through Acorn or through Sapling or, you know, give you a test that you write answers down and send in screenshots. There's a number of different ways to do it, and what we might do is like a kind of two-part thing because some of the questions we could easily do like multiple choice on acorn and then other kinds of questions i'd like to see you draw things out the drawing out stuff though is more important in the second half of the course anyway we will go through some more work today um please take advantage of the online solve midterms as well that should be helpful i think for preparing for the upcoming midterm even though realizing um, the solved ones generally only covered up to the end of chapter four. So I'll need to give you some practice that you can review on your own time on chapter five. Great. Any questions from people on the chat? No, oh, people are good. They like my picture. Uh, OK, so chiral nomenclature. Yes, question over here. Is the midterm open book? Uh, I think the answer to that is going to be no. Uh, although I have to think about that because I realize if you're online, it's difficult to police. Uh, so, I mean, one way to do it is make it open book. 
but I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question later. Uh, generally, what we do for the midterms is we allow you obviously a periodic table and as well that data sheet that you had. It's up, it's up on ACORN. It has the infrared charts. It has the carbon 13 NMR charts. Um, that's kind of the material that normally you'd have access to. The rest of it, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Yeah, I've, I've been reading a lot lately about how online testing has been working for people and anyone use the website Chegg? I shouldn't be t like telling you what this is. Yeah, don't use Chegg. <laughs> it's a website where you can like upload your exam and someone online will solve it for you and then like send you the answers. Don't do that. That's not good. All right. I had a question. Um, a question, regarding... yes. So do we have to be, if it's not open book, do we have to be able to memorize the the um, NMR spectrum for the hybridization where like um, where the alkyne ranges, where the aromatic carbon ranges that like, do we have to know all that? OK, so there's a question. Do you have to memorize all the ranges for carbon 13 yeah. NMR? Yeah. Absolutely not. Uh, the, the That's going to be given on the data chart, the data table that you're given. Okay. Either way. Right, so that's that's usually printed and attached to the back of the paper exam. Um, yeah, so you'll have access to that that table. Same one that's up on Acorn right now. All right, nomenclature. We spent a lot of time last class, a little time last class, learning how to identify the absolute stereochemistry of a chiral center. We have two names for them. We have either R or S and we can identify them as such. So if you have, let's give you an example. A molecule like this, and this is the chiral center. Um, what you would do first is look at the four different groups that are attached and rank them from top to bottom based on their atomic number. So which one of these atoms has the highest atomic number? Yeah, Cl is number one. What's number two? F. And then what? C or H? C. C. Good. And then H. <laughs> That's a four. Um, great. So we've done that. Now what we do is we orient the molecule so that the lowest priority group is pointing in the back, meaning it has a hashed bond like you see here. So that's fine. Then you ignore the lowest priority group and look at the remaining three and count in decreasing order. So one, two, three, decreasing priority top to bottom. And one, two, three means going around the molecule in this direction, just counterclockwise which is, think about turning the steering wheel in that direction. Your car goes to the left. This is turning to the left as well. And that means this is going to be S. Okay. So this one is maybe a more straightforward one. Let's do another example very quick. It's going to be our tetrahedral. Um, this compound. All right, right away, what's the lowest priority group here? H, always H. If H is there, it's going to be the lowest priority group. Because you can't get any lower in atomic number. Is my background distracting? Online people. Uh, highest priority group here is what? Br. Romy. Br. Good. Br is one is is there. Then we have nitrogen or carbon, which beats which is next highest. Nitrogen. nitrogen. And then carbon is three. Great. So the lowest priority group, the hydrogen, is it pointing forwards or backwards? Forwards. It's got the wedged bond, not the hashed bond. 
So that's no good. We need to redraw this molecule. And so we can do that. We can basically pretend you're going to take like a, an egg flipper. You know what I mean? Like what, what do they call them? Not a is that a spatula? Yeah. You're going to sneak up under this molecule and flip it upside down. So what's going to happen is the bromine, if you flip this molecule upside down, Br goes to the left, NH2 goes to the right, the CH3 comes forward. So we just flipped it. We didn't move any bonds. We didn't rotate anything. We didn't break any bonds or whatever. All we've done, and this would look, if you build this model and then just turn it over on top, this is what it's going to look like. All right, so let's renumber our one, two, three, four. <coughs> Lowest priority group is back now. This goes that way. That means this is also going to be S. There's another way to do this, which might you might find a little easier, which is forget about flipping it. Just look at that molecule. Realize that the hydrogen is not going back, so this is in the wrong orientation. And just register that thought in your mind. Hydrogen is in the wrong direction. Then look at the um, other compound, the other three groups. One, two, three. One, two, three goes around that way, which would be R. Realizing that the hydrogen is going the wrong way, that means we have to flip whatever we had. So rather than flipping the molecule, flip your answer. Right? So these are two different methods to show you that this is going to be S. Now, what we're going to look at today is maybe some more. Yes, question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK, Carl nomenclature. This is another example. Let's look at this compound, which is 2-pentanol. This has a chiral center right here. If you were to draw this out and show all the groups, we have a CH3. We have this, which is a CH2. We have an OH and a hydrogen. Highest priority group is going to be the oxygen. That's OK. Lowest priority group is going to be the hydrogen. That's OK. But the other two groups are both carbons. So based on the rule that we would have followed before, you can't say one is higher priority than the other. So what we do when you have a case like this is look and see what's attached to the carbons on both sides. And we basically pit them against each other to decide which one is going to be higher in priority. So the way that's going to look is think about the carbon on this side. It's bonded to a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. Right? Then the other carbon, which is this one, it's bonded to a carbon, which is that one, and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. And the three that I list here in parentheses, they're listed from highest rank to lowest rank. What you do is you compare element one. If they're tied, go to element two. If they're tied, go to element three. Now, comparing element one here, we just have hydrogen versus carbon. The winner here is going to be the carbon. So that means this is higher, and this one is lower. That means the ethyl here is going to get number two, and this methyl is going to get number three. And sometimes you might have to travel along the chain a little bit to find that point of difference. So this is going through the same exercise that we just did. And now we have the priority settled. The ethyl is number two. Actually, it's not ethyl. It's propyl. It gets two. The methyl gets three. And you can either say, you know, one, two, three is going that way which is S, realizing the hydrogens go, no, that's not S, that's R. 
realizing that the hydrogen is pointing in the wrong direction. That means this is S. Or what you can do is flip the molecule down here and then just do it like normal. One, two, three is S. Two different methods. I find the bottom method easier, but whichever you're more comfortable with. I find the bottom one easier, maybe not easier, maybe faster is a better word to, to use there. It's because you can do, if you have a molecule with multiple stereo centers, you can do them in your head. You don't have to flip them. Let's do this other example. And I think what I want to do is do this one, not through the slides, but do it on the uh, drawing pad. So that had, I think, this was the molecule. Make sure, yep, yeah, looks good. So this is the chiral center I'm interested in. Is that the only chiral center in the molecule? There's actually one more. There's one up here as well. But draw to aster wedge bonds there, so you can't tell if that one's R or S. But this one you can. So this has a hydrogen that's going back, right? That we don't draw because it's bond line. So we have four different groups here. Does anyone want to hazard a guess what the lowest priority group coming off this chiral center is? We're looking for lowest priority. H, yeah. So let's give the hydrogen four to begin with. Now, if you look at what else is attached to that carbon, we have A, B, and C. All three of those are carbons. So you can't assign priorities without looking at what's attached to them. So let's list them out. We have A, B, and C. So carbon A, which is this one, what's attached to that one? We have, uh, that A is gonna be in my way here. Hydrogen, hydrogen, and then there's a bond up here to another carbon. Right, so we always go forward. We don't go back from the chiral center. We, we, I know it has four things attached, but we go looking sort of always looking forward. So A is going to have a carbon, which is this one, which has another carbon attached, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. Carbon B, which is this one, it has a carbon, which is up here, and a hydrogen, and a hydrogen as well. C, which is down here, it has a carbon and a carbon, and a hydrogen as well that's a CH. Okay, so what do we do? We, we, we listed what was attached to each of these three groups. We rank those three things from highest to lowest priority, and now we look at the first element in the three. All of them are carbons, carbon, carbon, carbon. So using just the first element, you can't distinguish between these. So we forget about those, and then we go to the second element, and then all of a sudden there's a difference, right? C has a carbon, A and B just have hydrogens. So for C, we would say that this is going to be the highest priority group because it wins the battle of what's attached to that carbon that's, that's first there. Now we still have a tie between A and B, so we go to the third element and we see they're all hydrogens so you can't distinguish A or B from each other at this point. So what we do is we move up the chain. We move to the next point. So we forget about A and B, and now this one becomes our new A, and this becomes our new B. 
So that has a hydrogen attached. This has a hydrogen attached. A is a carbon. It's a carbon. And you see it's got a double bond, right? A's got a double bond to this carbon up here. The way we count double bonds is we just list carbon twice. C comma C. And then we have a hydrogen. Element B is a carbon. It's attached to <clears throat> an oxygen and a carbon and a hydrogen. So we compare the first elements and B has an oxygen, A has a carbon, so B wins. So B, going up the chain towards the right, gets second priority. Going around the ring to the left gets third priority. And now there's a whole lot of hen scratches all over this, but what you can see is number four, the low priority group is pointing back. Good. We ignore it. Look at the other three. And one, two, three goes around in that direction. If you turn a steering wheel, your car goes left. Left means S or sinister, right? So how was that? Not too bad? Yes, Lizzie. This this one here? Or you mean for this one here? Yes. It's because that carbon, which I listed here, is that one. It's bonded to a CH3. And this one is also a CH3. So this is one carbon. This is two carbons. And that's the hydrogen. So yeah. This carbon here is that one. This carbon here is that one. And this hydrogen is that one. Yes? Why would Because they're all starting at the same place. It's always going to be a tie. So the fourth one is like you're w working backwards. Yeah, so you always ignore that one. Yeah. Yes, another question. So the question I think was like, if you looked at this atom, I'm going to have to change my color because there's so much going on here. If you looked at that atom here, which is C, um, I'm going to read rot because there's too much happening here. Um, so you know, if you're comparing that carbon, that carbon, and that carbon, which is what we were doing before, you know, this one has four bonds. It has it has this carbon, it has this carbon, it has a hydrogen, but it also is bonded back to that carbon, back to the chiral center carbon. We don't list the backwards one. We don't list the one with the star because all the carbons coming off that which is the ones we're comparing, all have that bond. So if we're comparing them in the first place, we know that they're all coming from the same origin. So we always sort of branch outwards from the chiral center. Cool. That was one more example. This is, by the way, what I just did here is in the slides, kind of in gory detail, one at a time. Uh, so, you know, if you want to see that process again, I mean, I'll, I'll show you more examples, but um, definitely you can go back and you can uh, go through the slides and see that being done. Molecules with two stereocenters. We talked a lot about molecules with one stereocenter, and we said if, and by stereocenter, I just mean chiral center. Every time a molecule has one chiral center, it will be a chiral molecule. The story changes a bit, though, and we, we alluded to this earlier when you have two or more chiral centers. So if you look at this example for a minute, which is, uh, I guess, bromocyclobutanol, 2-bromocyclobutanol, um, this has two chiral centers, and a chiral molecule because if you take its mirror image, which is this one, 
it's not superimposable on it. If you took the one on the left and you tried to slide it over on top of the one on the right, the BR would overlap with the OH and the OH would overlap with the BR. So these are chiral because the mirror image is not the same molecule again. Okay, so the relationship between these, we would call them enantiomers. Which is great, got chiral centers. Uh, it, it, it satisfies all the criteria that we would have for a pair of chiral molecules. But look at this one. Also two chiral centers, very similar to the previous example, except now we have two OHs. This one, if you draw its mirror image, looks like this, but these are the exact same thing. Right? This is the same as its mirror image. If you slid the left molecule over on top of the right molecule, they overlap perfectly. So these are the same. So, but it's got chiral centers. How can it not be a chiral molecule? Well, it just isn't because its mirror image is the same thing again. So, this is an example of a molecule that we call meso, M-E-S-O. Meso means it has chiral centers, but is not overall chiral. Meaning, what does chiral mean? It means its mirror image is a different molecule. Well, this mirror image is not a different molecule. Therefore, this is not a chiral molecule. It'll be optically inactive. You could shoot some plain polarized light through it. Nothing's going to happen. It's not going to be rotated. Uh, you couldn't distinguish. There's no test you could do to distinguish between these two because they're the exact same thing. So we call these meso. Uh, here's my joke for the day, by the way. I gave this joke one year and like half the class didn't know what miso soup was. So yeah, miso soup is, yeah. I think miso soup is actually spelled M-I-S-O, but it's pronounced the same. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. That was, by the way, this was uh, a remnant of a previous year that I forgot to delete, which was a Nobel Prize that was given out a few years ago, which was interesting chemically. So meso compounds, here's a bunch of meso compounds. The, the way you can pick out a meso compound is it'll have an internal plane of symmetry. So you can see this compound, two chiral centers. It's got a plane of symmetry, which reflects the left hand of the molecule onto the right hand of the molecule. If it has a mirror plane in the molecule, anybody who's taking inorganic right now, Julia, I know you're taking it. Are you guys doing symmetry elements? Yeah, so it's a lot of good fun. We would call this a sigma symmetry element, uh, but just means there's a mirror plane in the molecule that reflects one side onto the other side. If it has that, it's not going to be chiral. And um, therefore, if you have two chiral centers like we have in this example, or like we have in this example, that's going to tell you that this is going to be meso. This one doesn't look like it has a mirror plane in it, but if you rotate that central bond around so that it looks like this, all of a sudden it has a mirror plane in it, and this becomes a meso compound. This becomes, this can be hard to see when you have a straight chain like this, but I would say anytime you have a zigzag, like a straight zigzag like that, find the middle point and rotate the bonds to make it look like this so that you can tell if there's going to be a mirror plane or not. Okay. There's going to be lots of examples of these kinds of questions on old midterms and so on. And we will dig up examples and make sure you guys are well prepared. You've seen all variations. That's what I find about making midterms for this course is, you know, I've been making midterms for this course for like 15 years and uh, I'm out of examples. So I'm, I, I go back to old examples a lot when I make midterms and stuff up. So it's a really good idea to do old midterms. Okay. Question. 
How many isomers are there, stereoisomers, for 2,3-dichlorobutane? So what I'm doing here is I'm taking butane, I'm drawing it like this, I'm drawing it like that rather than zigzag, because if you draw it like this, it'll be easy to tell if there's going to be a mirror plane in the molecule or not. And there's going to be four variations. Carbon 2 can be R or S. Carbon 3 can be R or S. So there's R, 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 S, S, R, S, S. And you can see these are the four possibilities for each of the chlorines, whether they're going forwards or backwards, when I draw it on this carbon skeleton. Now, if you look at it, each one of these has two chiral centers. Do any of these four molecules have a mirror plane in them? What do you think? Don't spoil it and look down at the bottom of the slide. Look at this one here. If you draw a horizontal line on the third one, horizontal, vertical line on the third one, to me at least, the left looks like a reflection of the right. This one on the end too, the left looks like a reflection of the right. So this compound, these two compounds turn out to be the same molecule. Meaning if you took the left one and you flipped it, it's going to look like the one on the right. We're going to get our spatula back. We're going to scoop it under number three, flip it upside down like a pancake. And what you're going to get is number four. So those are two different things. Those are the same thing, just drawn from two perspectives. So this is a real molecule, right? It doesn't have any internal mirror planes, because if you try to mirror one side to the other, one has a chlorine going front and one has a chlorine going back. So those are not, this does not have a mirror plane, this number one here. So this is a chiral molecule, and it will have a mirror image, which is two. Two is the mirror image of one. So these two are chiral because they have no internal mirror plane. They are mirror images of each other, and we call them enantiomers. Next, we have three and four. Three and four, these are the same thing as we mentioned already. So how many stereoisomers are there? There's only three. There's the RR, there's the SS, and then there's whichever one of these we want to talk about, we have the meso. There's only three possible stereoisomers for this one. So we drew the same one two times. Um, good. Everyone happy? This is going to the same thing, showing why those are the same thing. Oh, God. Fisher projections. This is everyone's least favorite part of the course, or maybe just part of this chapter for sure. Um, Fisher projections are an older way of uh, depicting chiral centers in molecules, and we still do it because it's still widely used mainly in biochemistry and mainly for looking at carbohydrates. So for anyone in the course who's in nutrition, this is uh, probably commonly used to describe the chemistry of any carbohydrate. Um, so Fisher projections are just another way of representing a three-dimensional structure in two dimensions. We have several ways already, right? We have Newman projections. We have our dashed and wedged bonds, which is probably most common. My favorite, because it's actually showing you the actual structure. Uh, so here's what we do, is we rotate all carbon-carbon bonds in the molecule until all atoms are eclipsed. So if we start with a structure like this, you see if we rotate the carbons around, you get this confirmation. This is rotating around that central CC bond. Now, what you do is you orient the molecule 
so that the carbon chain is oriented vertically up and down. And you want it so that the groups that are sticking out horizontally are coming towards you. So for this molecule, that would mean your eye is going to be up above here, looking down at that molecule from that angle. So what you want to do is draw what that molecule would look like from that perspective. Okay, so if you were here and this is your nose and that's your mouth and you were looking down at the molecule, it would look like the chlorines would be sticking out to the right, the hydrogens would be sticking out to the left, and the carbons, the two methyls, will be going forwards and backwards. Um, you're spotlighted. My video is highlighted for everyone in the meeting. I don't know what that means. Uh, okay, so you would end up drawing it like this. And then what we do is we take that structure, we take a rolling pin, we flatten everything out. The hash and wedge bonds become solid. And you get this structure you see on the right. So what does this structure mean? It means anything that's vertical is going back. Anything that's horizontal is coming towards you. Okay. So I want to show you just another way of thinking about this. Okay. My screwed up cat. Cat's happy because his tail's up. So Fisher projection is like this. We're going to take our cat. We're going to put him on a glass table. And you are going to be underneath the glass table. Looking super intense. And you are going to be looking up at the cat from that perspective. Okay, what would the cat look like? Well, what you would see is you would see the belly. The tail would be going kind of down, but back away from you, right? It's tail it's up, but back away from you. The head, you're kind of looking at the chin, right? But the head is kind of going up but backwards away from you. You're going to have one leg on the left and on the right, and on the back it has one leg on the left and one on the right. Right? That's what the cat would look like if you were underneath the table looking at it from that perspective. Let's take a molecule. Let's take... Both of those bonds are kind of bad. We have this molecule. This is our cat. It looks just like a cat. It's got the tail, right? This is the tail here. It's got a left and a right leg on the back, a left and a right leg on the front, and it's got a head. So we're going to do the exact same thing as before. We're going to get underneath this thing. And we're going to look at it from that perspective. This is easy if it's a cat. Why is it so hard when it's a molecule? So you got to think about what this structure really looks like in three dimensions. It looks just like a cat. So what's that going to look like? Well, you're going to look at the belly of this molecule, which is right here. It's going to be a carbon and a carbon. There's going to be a methyl now up at the top going back and a methyl now at the bottom going back as well. On the top carbon, which is this one, there's a chlorine coming towards us. That's going to look like it's on the left. And a hydrogen attached to the right. And on the back carbon, we have a bromine 
on the left. Can you see how that looks like a cat? How these are the same thing? So for the Fisher projection, that's all we're drawing. The cat structure. And then we flatten the thing out. Just we, we draw the same thing, except we get rid of the hashed and wedged bonds. This is the Fisher projection of that structure. And this is most often used when you have a carbon chain that has multiple chiral centers. So you'll see these things that kind of look like this. OH hydrogen, OH hydrogen, OH hydrogen. So usually we always have the carbon chain vertical. This would be a standard way of representing a sugar. Sugars have, this has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Uh, carbons have a cyclic form and an open chain form. This would be the open chain form. And every single chiral center in the sugar is represented like that. And the simple sugars will mainly differ from each other whether each of those OHs are left or right, or whether each of the chiral centers are R or S. So the difference between glucose and galactose and whatever, what else do we have? Maltose, I think, is a disaccharide, but there's a bunch of, of simple sugars that all differ based on the position of those chiral centers. So we will see Fisher projections again. We'll do some more examples of these eventually. If you take a Fisher projection like you see below and rotate the whole thing around 180, basically if you draw it on a sheet of a sheet of paper upside down, you get this. These are identical representations. Normally what we do is we want to have the carbon that's more oxidized on the top, but in this case it's the same in both directions, so it doesn't doesn't matter which way you draw it. You can draw it either way. Um, you can rotate, so if you think about a Fisher projection, this is still a single bond here. That can be rotated around. And so you can swap the positions of each one of these if you want. Like what's going on up here? Those are equivalent to each other, but convention is to have the carbon chain vertical. So you wouldn't want to flip it around like this anyway. The, the vertical chain, all carbon, 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 carbon. Cool. So these are a bunch of sugars. These are all simple sugars, allose, altrose, glucose, mannose, gulose, iodose, galactose, talose. These are all the cyclic forms. All of these adopt chair structures. They all look like cyclohexane chairs but they also have an open form as well. And the open forms look like this. And it's really because of sugars that we have to worry about Fisher projections at all, right? This is sort of the thrust behind why we use Fisher projections. Let's do some examples. Show the two stereoisomers of 2,3-difluorobutanol. So butane means four, one, two, three, four. Uh, one all means carbon one has an OH. And two, three difluoro looks like this. This actually has four stereoisomers, not two, but you could pick any two you want. Show any two stereoisomers. So what that means is we have a chiral center here and a chiral center here. Each one of those could be R or S. So the four possibilities are going to be 2R, 3R, 2R, 3S, 2S, 3R, 2S, 3S. Another way to think about this is you could have, if you think about carbon two, which is here, or carbon three, you could have hydrogen, hydrogen, fluorine, fluorine, 
or hydrogen, fluorine, fluorine, hydrogen. You could be left, left, right, right. All right, left, left, right, right, left, right, right, left. Are your four possibilities. So what we're asked to do here is, is draw two of them, which I didn't have to think very hard. You just put them in the spots where they can go. And now we have to determine the um, RRS for these things. Well, I'll show you how to do RRS on a structure like this. I'm going to do the top one. I'm going to move back here because it gives me more control. All right, this one's the one we're going to look at. Let's look at carbon two, which I've circled in pink. What's the lowest priority group on that carbon? H. Let's give H four to begin with. What's the highest priority element? F is one. And what else do we have? We we have a carbon and a carbon, so we got to go through our procedure here to rank these two things. So the top carbon, what does it have attached? Coming from the chiral center, we don't count the chiral center over again. We're going forwards away from the chiral center. We have an oxygen, the OH, and we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen, right? We have a hydrogen and a hydrogen that are not drawn in. Now C3, I'll call it. Carbon three has a fluorine, a carbon, which is down at the bottom of the end of the chain, and it's got a hydrogen off to the left. So we've listed them in decreasing order. So now we can compare the top and the bottom. The first element is different, which is higher priority, fluorine or oxygen? Fluorine, right. So that means that Second priority goes to this bottom group. Third priority goes to this top group. Ignoring the lowest priority group, one, two, three goes around this way, which would be R. But the hydrogen, is it coming forwards or going backwards? Like either it's sticking out on the side. No, it's not sticking out on the side. This is a 2D representation. What that really means is that carbon has the horizontal things are coming out, remember? And the top thing is going back. That's what the Fisher projection means. So the hydrogen's coming forward. So that means it's not in the back. The lowest priority group is not in the back. So it's going to be the opposite of whatever we said it was going to be. It's going to be S. So this is maybe an example where it's better just to like do it based on the way it's drawn and then flip it as opposed to trying to redraw this molecule in a way that orients the lowest priority group backwards. Uh, I'm going to switch my pencil color and do the next one, which is carbon three. Uh, this one we have again, lowest priority group is the hydrogen. Highest priority group again is the fluorine. And then we have two carbons. We have C2 versus C4. C2 has what attached? It's got a fluorine, which is out here. We've got a carbon, which is up here. We've got a hydrogen off to the left. Now we have carbon four. It's just got hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. It's a CH3. So the winner is going to be carbon two. So carbon two is second priority. The methyl is third priority. We forget about the hydrogen. One, two, three goes around that way. Counterclockwise, that turns the car to the left. You ran the steering wheel that way. That's S. But our hydrogen, because it's in a horizontal position, is coming towards us. So we have to flip our S. R. 
So this one is S here and R here. So I'm going to go back. When the fluorine is to the right, on the top carbon it's S, and when it's on the right, on the bottom carbon, it's R. So that means this one is S, and this one is R. That's what we just solved, right? Now, do we got to do it all over again for this one? No. If the fluorine is S when it's on the right on the first structure, it's going to still be S when it's on the right on this structure. And fluorine was R when it was to the right on the bottom structure. Well, it's on the left in this one, so this has got to be S yes over here. So you can quickly, you, may, you have to go through the procedure to assign R and S the first time, but after that, you can kind of quickly pop through. Okay, we're out of time. Remember, class on Friday is going to be online. Um, we're kind of done for material for chapter five. The only thing left that we can do is kind of do some review and I'll, I'll maybe think of some review and post it. Um, yeah, and the Instagram too. We're, we're doing quite a lot of these questions in Instagram now too, which is good to see. All right, thanks everybody. I will be sending an email about Friday's class. Um, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Yes, Thank so you. the midterm will cover up to the end of this chapter. Okay. Thanks, everybody.